Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Tools, Techniques, and Mental Models. Today, we're going to be looking at Deming's 14 points in management philosophy. We're going to learn how to apply them in a construction business. So that's what we're going to be checking out today. Join me. Edwards Deming is who I'm referring to about Deming's 14 points. Deming was one of the pioneers in the development of quality control systems. He goes back to the 1940s and 50s and 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, into the 2000s uh, with uh, basically his principles. And he came up with these 14 points that today are very, very instrumental in the way that we look at improving quality methods and also improving productivity, profitability, eliminating waste, they all work together in sync with each other. So that's why it's so fundamentally important. And as we've had this large movement uh, away from traditional methods towards more lean methods in construction, these 14 points can help guide us in many ways and give us a lot of ideas for how to effectively manage our construction businesses when it comes to lean and eliminating waste and improving productivity and improving profitability. So some of the things that came out of Deming's work was Six Sigma, the Toyota production system, lean manufacturing methodologies, and lean construction. Lean construction originated from Ballard and Howell and uh, numerous other people that were involved in that process and are still involved in that process. But definitely at its roots, a lot of the principles, original principles, comes from Deming, Duran, Schuert, uh, a few other uh, pioneers in the area. Plan, do, check, act, PDCA. Deming's also known for that as well. So one of the elements that came out of Deming's work was the PDCA or PDSA cycle that we refer to so often. So 14 point plan. All right, so let's take a look at Deming's 14 point plan in management philosophy. Create, number one, create constancy of purpose, improvement of the product and service so as to become competitive. Stay in business and provide jobs. So it's really important to have a constancy, a consistent effort towards this. It's big on playing the long game. It's not about short wins. It's about being in it for the long haul. And that really plays well. And there's an expectation that senior management is not making it the flavor of the month. You know, you really have to have senior management's involvement to have success in this area. Consistency matters. Consistency matters in how we treat people. Consistency matters in philosophy of how we're going to approach our business. That's why it's important to have a vision. That's why it's important to have a mission and understand what you're all about. Don't be flip-flopping. If you're flip-flopping, everybody doesn't all your workers, they don't know what you're doing. And you will not get the optimization that you're after from your workforce, which is very vital in Deming's 14 points. Adopt the new philosophy. We are in a new economic age. It, this was written in the 1980s. And it's uh, interesting, the new philosophy, and we're in a new economic age. Well, I think we can just fast forward to today. And we definitely have a lot massive economic changes that are taking place, massive disruptive technological changes that are taking place. The hope is, and the belief is, we no longer need to live with commonly accepted levels of delay, mistakes, defective material, and defective workmanship. Well, if you've read the McKinsey Group Global Institute report on productivity in the construction industry, you know that we have a long way to go. Uh, we are underperforming other industries, manufacturing, the overall marketplace by a substantial margin. And some people get upset, you know, when I say that, but I mean it in the best of ways. It means there's the greatest opportunity for improvement for us. It's not like we're at 1% uh, waste and we're trying to get it down to a half a percent waste. We've got a lot of waste, depending on what matrix you look at, anywhere from 30 plus percent to over 60 percent if we're counting the, uh, the aspects of management as well. Um, so there's a lot of waste in the construction industry. We just have to be able to improve on it. And if we follow the 14 point plan, if we continuously improve. We're going to get better and better over time and not stagnate on that. So the construction industry, this is big. There's huge opportunities in this area. We have BIM, 
we have lean, we have prefabrication as a result of advances in technologic technology like BIM and scanning technology that we can actually do things and be confident that they will fit in the final building product that we're constructing. In the past, you know, if we prefabricated too much, if it was outside the tolerances or if we missed something, then we had to redo it and it wasn't worth it. Um, today, that's changing with technology. And training will play, will play a big role. Adopt the new philosophy, as Deming said. Cease dependence on mass inspection. Require instead statistical evidence that quality is built in. This is really sort of changing the way, if we look at lean construction practices, well, Deming's points could be applied there, where, what, where we think of the customer. Who is the customer? The customer is anything, anybody that we're providing something to. They're not even necessarily who's paying us. The customer for the drywaller might be the painter. What's the quality expectation of the painter? Are you delivering what they need to do to be able to do their role nice, smooth, and continuously, right? Uh, so if we really understand the relationships with, between the customers, again, not the traditional client who's paying you, that's also in there, but who we're passing things off to, like the baton passed off in the relay? Are we making sure that it's a good even pass off exchange so that we don't have rework issues and quality issues? Improve the quality of incoming materials in the end the practice of awarding business on the basis of price alone. Instead, depending on meaningful measures of quality along with price. Construction, we do have a tendency to award to the lowest price. We have lump sum bidding on projects. We award to the lowest price, very often at our peril, very often at government agencies' peril. Lump sum contracts are still the most prevalent type of contract in the construction industry. We have lots of opportunities with different models, contract models uh, coming of age, like IPD, Integrated Project Delivery. Uh, and there's other ways of doing construction projects that are less adversarial than going with the low price and then trying to really tightly control that particular trade contractor to make sure that they meet the quality expectations while they're trying to cut corners because they cut the price so low that it's difficult for them to be profitable. So we really need to take a look at our procurement methods. Also, we have to think about our supply chain better. We have to think about building better relationships with our suppliers. I was just talking to one of my graduates who's uh, started a custom home building business and he really went into detail about the time that he spends building relationships with the suppliers so he can get the materials when he wants them, when he needs them at a value oriented price and how important those relationships are to his business. It means that we really do have to work at that better than we have in the past. Uh, number five, find the problems, constantly improve the system of production and service. There should be continual reduction of waste and continual improvement of quality in every activity so as to yield a continual rise in productivity and a decrease in costs. In construction, we do a really good job of workarounds. We don't do such a great job of getting at the root cause of the problem, so we run into these workarounds all the time. We really want to get do a better job at finding the root cause of a problem and working to eliminate that so that we don't have to face it over and over and over again. That's going to make us much more productive. That's going to greatly reduce rework. That's going to cut down on your costs, and that's going to improve your profits. Right there. This is a, a big one again. Institute modern methods of training and education for all. Modern methods of on-the-job training use control charts to determine whether a worker has been properly trained and is able to perform the job correctly. Statistical methods must be used to discover when training is complete. Okay, so now you're in my realm. When I do a lot of training with companies, very often they don't want to invest in the follow-up side of the training. You train somebody, and you spend a lot of time on it, and you spend a fair bit of money on it, but it, did it take? Was the training at the right level? Did the training need to have some corrections in it? Does the individual need to take the training more than once to reap the benefits? 
Do we have any way of tracking how this is working in the field? We have to think about it just like the PDA, BDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. We have to plan it. We have to do it. And then we have to evaluate how we're doing on it. And then we have to improve upon it. And when it comes to training, just saying take this program, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've got the outcomes met. Is it being met in practical? practice can we measure that in practice how can we measure that do we have metrics for it so it's important from that point of view and up here in the corner i've got you know when we talk about point five find problems constantly improve the system of production continual reduction of waste continual improvement of quality right so why did this happen right and you want to dig down maybe you use a tool like the five whys and you keep going until you find the root cause and then you try to make sure that it doesn't happen again, right? You build something into your system. Perhaps you have a checklist that you have developed so that there's an insurance that when these sauna tubes are laid out, it's going to fit the actual uh, prefabricated steel that's going to be assembled on site. Uh, otherwise, you get a lot of rework going on and you get a lack of quality. And we can improve on that in construction. I just took that picture on a simple walk one morning when I was going to do a lecture on that topic, and it wasn't hard to find those kind of things out there. Institute modern methods of supervision. The emphasis of production supervisors must be to help people do a better job. Think of your role as a manager to facilitate the process. Improvement of quality will automatically improve quality productivity. There's a big opportunity to improve our leadership practices within the construction industry, to make sure that we institute mechanisms that gets people more engaged and involved in the work that they're doing, that we are able to pick their brains, to get their input, because all of us is smarter than one of us when we're talking about complex projects, because none of us knows any uh, all of the aspects of a complex project. So those are important things to um, consider and to ensure that we're getting their full uh, participation and that we're creating an environment where people are not afraid to give ideas. If you've got an idea, you want those presented. If they're going to be laughed at, then they're not going to present it. They're going to shut down and you're losing those valuable contributions. Fear is a barrier to improvement. So drive out fear by encouraging encouraging that two-way uh, communication and using other mechanisms that will enable everybody to be part of change and to belong to it. This is very similar to what I said in point seven. We want to make sure that uh, our employees are not fearful of making a mistake. Uh, then usually what happens is it gets hidden, people don't want to it found out, and then it shows up later as a rework warranty issue. Uh, you also want to make sure your environment is safe to work in from an Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulations point of view, uh, but also in all means and respects. People need to feel that they are respected and that they are going to be treated well and that they're going to be treated morally and ethically in the appropriate ways. And if you don't create that environment, you don't have an effective workplace. You don't have a, a workplace that is optimized. And you are not going to be productive and your business is not going to do well in the long term. Number nine, break down barriers between departments. In, we have this in corporate, right? Large corporations where we have silos. We have this in colleges. You know, we have different divisions and then within the divisions, we have different departments and each one is their own little silo or fiefdom uh, that goes on and if we don't have good cross communication and pollination between the departments then we are not optimized we are not working at our utmost best so what we need to do is look at ways to break down those barriers now as you know i'm just saying these points these bullets below i'm really referring to the application of these points in construction and if we think about silos, well, just think about the difference between trade partners. Each one is almost like a no, its own department. How do we break down those barriers to get better communication flow? 
construction is very multifaceted. We have architects, uh, con engineers, all of the array of specialized consultants. We have our trade partners. We have our suppliers. We have our clients. We can go on. But this, uh, there's a multitude of interactions here, and we can't be operating in silos that contain information that's vital to the success of the project. So true optimization, optimization requires a really good breaking down of the barriers. Deming was not a fan of slogans, posters, exhortations of, for the workforce. You know, big posters posted on the wall. Um, it reminds me of the old saying that I, a neighbor of mine who's you know, been through World War II and um, came to Canada with barely nothing and uh, was through the Holocaust and different things of that nature. And it's uh, got a lot, she has a lot of wise words to share. Uh, but one of the ones that she always uh, would say to me would be, show me, don't tell me. Show me, don't tell me. If somebody's running around telling you all the time, but they're not showing you, then that's a real indication, right? It's much better when somebody just does something and you see it for what it is. They don't have to tell you. You understand it there. It's, you know, if you keep telling me job, quality is job one, quality is what we do, quality, 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 and then you see that's not what's happening, that's worse because then the culture starts to believe that they're being lied to uh, within the business because the people that work within the business know that too. So you really want to make sure that it's being um, lived and breathed upon. doesn't mean that, in my opinion, that slogans are a bad thing, but if you're going to say something, you better make sure that you're following it, right? If you're saying it and not following it, then that's much, much worse. And I think that was to Deming's point, because at that time, he saw a lot of those kind of things. And that's kind of the flavor of the month. Oh, we're going to do this, and we're going to position ourselves this way and market ourselves this way. But if you're not doing it, that's not what you want to do. And that's, you know, the work of uh, Deming and Duran, and that kind of led to the overall quality improvement programs through Japan, uh, through uh, the advances in the automotive sector, the Toyota production system. It really was about doing it, right, and showing it. And that's they really got a good reputation for building quality without having to say that much about it because the car, people that bought the cars, they weren't breaking down. And that word spreads. It takes time, but it spreads. Eliminate work standards that prescribe numerical quotas for the workforce and numerical goals for people in management. Uh, he was not a fan of extrinsic rewards. He was very concerned about, you know, if, if we finish all of our homes and we close them on time, I'm using a construction example. He would have used a manufacturing example, correct? Uh, so if we finish all our homes and we finish them on time, you're going to get this big bonus. Yeah, you're going to get a big bonus, uh, but you're going to have a lot of quality issues. A lot of the houses will get done but people will cut corners to meet that reward. So you got to be very careful. I'm personally a believer. You've watched my YouTube channel. You've seen a number of my videos. I'm very goal oriented, but you got to have the right goals. And if you're going to make an extrinsic reward system built around some of them, you better make sure that they're developed in the right way. Best reward system is intrinsic rewards. And we've got so much to offer in construction that way. Um, so we definitely need goals, and I'm not, you know, I've talked about Peter Drucker and management by objectives, but we do have to be careful about those goals, and we have to manage them very carefully because we can get the wrong results if we're not careful. And if we have a lot of quality issues in construction, that means we have a lot of rework. I don't know construction companies that can have a lot of rework and still be profitable. We need to be data driven. Uh, data -driven. Uh, and we need to use the right data. So example in Lean, we use plan percent complete. Very simple data too. It doesn't necessarily have to be that complex. But we need to gather it. We need to measure it. We need to monitor it. And we need to act on it. Uh, plan percent complete basically means how many activities do we plan to get done this week? We, need to get, we plan to get done 10 activities. We got 8 of them done. Then we've got 80% PPC for the week. But we also have a lot of advances in the construction industry uh, using productivity tools uh, that can gather data relatively easy. So we've got to figure out what's the best data because sometimes there's just so much data. 
what is the best metrics for us to look at and to utilize to give us really good statistical evidence of how we're doing and where we can improve. We can bring in some of the work of Duran with the 2080 uh, principle and uh, Pareto's law and the, criti the critical few, the trivial many or the useful many uh, into uh, this uh, argument here or this um, philosophy. And um, those can be helpful tools for as, as well. So using productivity tools to simplify and improve data collection will be helpful. Uh, remove the barriers that rob hourly workers and people in management of the right to pride of workmanship. So if we de-skill everything and we don't give that engagement opportunity for all of our skilled workers, uh, then we lose that intrinsic involvement. And um, he really wasn't, again, a fan of like merit ratings. So he's a little bit different than a lot of different viewpoints. Uh, you know, so you just, as I mentioned, you have to be careful about how you set up extrinsic reward systems, uh, but you have to think about second and third order consequences. We close all the order houses on time. Yay, that's a good thing. Oh, our houses are closed on time. Second order consequence would be, yeah, but we have a lot of warranty issues. Third order consequence would be, as a result of all these warranty issues and going back to people's houses, they are not happy and they are not helping our brand. It's giving us our brand a negative connotation to it. Um, so we should reconsider that closing everything on time unless we have a way of also measuring the warranty issues with that extrinsic reward to offset that negative aspect. So be careful about um, those points. Institute a vigorous program of education. Well, he's way ahead of his time on this. He knew the importance, he knew how fast the world changes and the importance of continually educating your workforce and creating a environment where continuous improvement, continuous learning, uh, lifelong learning is important. So construction industry is changing very fast. Businesses need to be better attuned to that change. And we have to make sure that we have mechanisms in place that we can build our businesses for the long term. I think very astute small business owners think in that way and they want to help their employees to be the best they can be. And whatever education in-house or outside that they can assist with, make sure that they're setting up solid pathways for those employees. And that way they retain their employees over a longer period of time. You know what? Everybody I talk to is having trouble getting good people in the construction industry, right? And if you get somebody good and you spend a lot of time in that recruitment process of onboarding them, you want to amortize that investment that you spent in getting them on by retaining them. So you want to make sure that you've developed a really good internal labor market opportunities for those people to advance and part of that is the vigorous program in education. And the world is changing very fast and you want to have up-to-date people working for you. Number 14 is the last one. It kind of takes us back to the beginning. Um, it really means, you know, it can't be the flavor of the month. It's got to be a permanent commitment. Top management has to be involved. Uh, don't be letting it down to the second order managers to just only talk about it. You've got to be telling the story over and over and over again. And that's important. That Somebody has to be waving the flag that this is what we're about and making sure it is what we're about. Uh, that was Deming's point. Otherwise, you're not going to get optimization and continuous improvement. And your quality standards leads to a lot of waste lower productivity, a lot of rework, higher costs, less profit, more losses. You can continue and continue with this, right? So systems need to be built into habits and those habits need to be built into routines and the routines become rituals in the way that you do things. It's very ingrained in the business and quality just becomes a natural way of doing things. If you really follow Deming's 14-point plan, it really makes the difference between companies that advance using this and companies that failed using this. There's a lot of companies that fail at 
instituting lean practices because they kind of do it half-heartedly. They're not all in. They bail at the first opportunity. They don't do what they say. They don't do the show me, right? They do the tell me instead. So if you institute these 14 points that Deming was smart enough to come up with with all the experience and years of wisdom built working with industry, uh, I think that you will find a lot of positive benefits as your construction business grows. So I'm Tom Stevenson, hoping you enjoyed Deming's 14-point plan. Uh, please click the subscribe uh, icon below. Uh, make sure you put your comments. You know, if you have a question or maybe you've had an experience where, ah, we tried lean and it didn't work and this is why it didn't work. Or, uh, you know, we'd like to try this. What do you think? It's good to create a community of comments uh, on this uh, YouTube uh, channel. And that's what we're trying to do here because it's something that's needed in the construction industry. So I'm Tom Stevenson, wishing you a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.